the spot, but I would just ask that everybody make sure your, your uh, devices are silent for the speakers. This is uh, Megan Wright with her presentation. Hello. Is the mic on? Oh, cool. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> so uh, I'm recovering, and my voice is almost gone, but uh, that was as of yesterday, so I decided I'd come through and still do the talk. So forgive me for the crackly voice. So my name's Megan Roddy. Um, I'm currently a senior security analyst at Recon InfoSec, a small MSSP startup in Austin, Texas. I recently graduated with my master's degree. I have a few security certs. Um, I do this regularly. This is my 12th time speaking at a security conference and my first time with technical difficulties. I knew it'd come around eventually. Um, and that's my Twitter handle. I'm almost up to 600 followers, so I'm almost internet famous if you wanna help me get there. So I'm not gonna spend too long talking about G Suite. How many of you use G Suite at work? Just a few. How many know what G Suite is? Everyone knows what G Suite is, kind of. So it's Google's like paid business version. Think of it of the as the O365 of um, Google. It's going to be Google Drive, Google Mail, Google Calendar, all synced across the organization. So um, as a startup MSSP, we serve small. Um, small and medium sized businesses. G Suite is cheap and so we encounter a lot of G Suite instances. And so I've started to have to learn defer in G Suite, hence the uh, origin of this talk. So first we're gonna talk about a bit about uh, defer G Suite versus traditional uh, defer. And when I say traditional defer, I'm talking about your traditional Windows domain environment, a bunch of domain connected computers, emails on an on-prem exchange server, connect, and your users are connected via AD, everything's local machines. So obviously there's a bunch of different cases of defer, but that's, that's kind of what I'm speaking about when I say traditional defer. So I'm not gonna go too much into the red teaming of G Suite. There's a really, really great talk um, from Black Hills InfoSec that's uh, this link at the bottom, and I'll share out my slides later so you have it. But uh, the, the kill chain's gonna be the same. Reconnaissance, they're gonna find out what your G Suite domain is, and after that, try and figure out what accounts exist. So that's gonna be a uh, recon that you do with um, other uh, email address findings. So you find out the company uses the format of first.lastname at corp.net. So then you just generate a list based on the list of employees at LinkedIn. With weaponization and delivery, we're focused less on malware or breaking in through insecure firewalls. And here we're gonna be talking more about brute forcing, phishing, social engineering, uh, exploitation, getting those credentials, uh, using the methods I discussed. We're gonna achieve persistence, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Command and control, there's, um, th there's not as much of that command and control aspect of malware calling home because the attacker can access the console from wherever they are. They're not remote going into a domain environment. Uh, then there's a lot of things they can do with the account. They can exfil data. They can abuse the account for their own purposes. So again, there's great talk about how to red team G Suite, but I'm gonna move on and talk about the blue team side of things. So traditional defer, there's a whole range of different um, incidents that we can encounter. You can encounter malware, phishing, denial of service, web attacks, and that's just a short list starting off. And some other, the attacks, and these can all be seen in a traditional environment, but the, the sole ones that we're kind of really focusing on in G Suite are really a, a related to the mail and the file storage, which are phishing, potential for leak of information, um, and the potential for account abuse. So those are do fall under uh, traditional defer too, but that's the, the focus of what's gonna happen, what you're gonna see in G Suite. <clears throat> 
for the attack vector, obviously the G Suite is hosted on Google servers and you're accessing it through Google in the cloud. So you're not gonna see the attack vectors like um, SQL injection, web attacks, because Google's got it pretty locked down and if you do experience that compromise, then there's a whole bigger issue. It's Google's fault, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna be an issue, but there's nothing you can do from the response side. The platform is owned by them. So in a traditional deeper environment, they may have gone through your firewalls, they may have exploited a web app, they could have fished or um, social engineered or brute forced, and that's what the only thing we're really gonna see in G Suite Deeper is that method of getting logging credentials, because that's the only way you're gonna access the platform and the environment. So, <laughs> Um, in terms of the environment, again, traditional deeper, we're talking about big networks, tons of computers, um, servers, workstations, network devices, firewalls, and in terms of the configuration, I mean, you might have AD to Active Directory or something like that to essentially configure like the workstations, um, but really you're going to have a bunch of widespread configurations. Uh, if an attacker gets in, they can reconfigure the local machine settings, or if they access a network device, they can reconfigure those settings. So you've got safe spread all over the place. Whereas in G Suite, we have a single platform, that cloud G Suite platform, and you have all the core configuration set, uh, settings centralized to your admin console. And so when you're trying to find out what the current settings in the environment are, or if somebody might have changed settings, you kind of got that single pane of glass as opposed to logging into 40 different types of devices trying to see where settings may have changed. So the, kind of the summary of that is that traditional deeper, when we're talking about regular deeper, we're talking about a large attack surface, a ton of different types of incidents that you may re be responding to, and looking for evidence or artifacts. There's tons of sources, tons of configuration, tons of data stored in different places. Whereas G Suite, you've got, you have to get a login to log in. Um, you, you need specific, uh, there's gonna be a few specific incident types that you encounter as opposed to a bunch of different methods. And all your data and configuration settings are contained within the platform. So I didn't spend too much time kind of going on the whole overview because the point of my talk was more focused on coming to like a real world scenario because I think that's more useful uh, to be able to show you guys what, what I'm putting into practice. So this is, the scenario details are gonna be pretty generic because I'm under NDA, but this is something I, an actual incident I worked. So it's, it's coming from real life, it's not made up. Basically, we got an email saying our, so it was a company, they had a bunch of clients, rich, private people, and they, um, all of a sudden, like all their clients, specific to their client list, it seemed like maybe their client list had leaked, like those people are getting spam and phishing emails related to this company. And so it seemed like someone found the client list, but they don't publish the client list publicly. There's no, no way they could have gone publicly. And they thought, well, the only place that we really have all that information would be in the emails or files or contacts in our G Suite instance. But we have no idea. Like, we, we weren't hacked as far as we know. We weren't fished. So, so how did they get in? So they contracted Recon to come in and find out where we compromised. So starting this incident, we know there might be a compromise. Nothing has been done because they don't know if there's a compromise. And we need to find out everything. We need to find out who compromised them, when were they compromised, how were they compromised, why were they compromised. So. Like I said, G Suite, really the only entrance, they're not gonna be performing SQL injections and bypassing logins. The only real entrance is by logging in, whether that was because they brute forced the credentials or fished or whatever. So you can export the audit logs in G Suite of all the logins and 
This is the less detailed version. It just has IP date event. You can also see whether they were logging in using um, single sign-on on another application or whether they were using um, Outlook or something to log on. But for our purposes, we just wanted to see all the IPs. Well, here we have th three unique IPs, pretty, pretty easy to parse through, do some who is, see if anything's strange going on. And if you did, you'd find out there's uh, two US IP addresses, and then there's a Chinese IP address. And if my calculations are right, Bob cannot log in from the US at 6 p.m. and then be in China at midnight. So something's going wrong. But th that's all fine for this. But in our actual scenario, we had probably hundreds of IP addresses. And so a lot of it for me at the time was manual review. I uploaded a lot of them into like a GeoIP lookup and then kind of scrolled through, cross-correlated which IPs were which users. So it took a good amount of time, but sure enough, we have actually found, huh, strange. Alice was in Kansas, and then five minutes later, she logged on from India. And so there was kind of definitely some abnormal activity. And you may think so, like maybe she was using a VPN or something that was messing with the, uh, the IP address to be a different location, but typically our clients we're dealing with, they're outsourcing their IT and cybersecurity for a reason. So they're not using fancy tools that would mess with their IP. And sure enough, so, so then we have, we have this one IP. Uh, so we have the IP, uh, sorry, I lost my uh, track. So, once, once I did this work, my uh, boss, Eric Capuano, you should check out, he open sourced this tool. So I did all the work and he was like, wow, that was really manual. So I'm gonna make it not manual now that the incident's over. But it, now you guys don't have to do what I did. So he wrote a Python script. You, you upload the CSV that I showed you and it plots all the logins and it's actually color coded. So like red is failed login, Yellow is one thing, blue is successful login. And it's plotted on a map. This is pretty usual activity, especially the company. We knew they occasionally went um, into the Bahamas and stuff like that. So, you know, nothing strange about the Mexico, Cuba type logins. Uh, but then when you plot this, at the same time, that starts getting a little suspicious that you have a cluster of logins in the US and then you have these blue successful logins in Africa a few minutes later. So this is a really cool tool now that's open source. You go to that blog post, it has a link. It's actually an interactive map. You can click on the little points and see what exactly it means. And so like if I click on that point, it says Alice logged in at whatever time. So now it's all automated. Um, but before we re manually review the logs, so at this point, we know that there's definitely something weird going on, and we know what user was affected. We also have the timestamps for the logins, so we know now that this attacker has been in the system for four months, and they hadn't noticed until now, and he's been logging in from Africa on and off over the course of the past several months. So yeah, winner is Alice, and four months ago. So we start our containment phase of incident response. We disable her account. We reset the password on her account. We leave it disabled until the uh, entire scenario is complete. And also Google, the cool thing is you can reset um, the login sessions from the admin panel for a user so that the cache credentials also get cleared. So that that attacker was using cache credentials, it would force those cookies to be deleted and that attacker would have to re-log in and with the password change that didn't work. So we come back to our, our where are we now? We know whose account was compromised. We know when it was compromised. At this point, we know that the login activity we're seeing with the compromised account is not happening anywhere else. Those strange abnormal overseas logins are only happening with this one account. So we're not 100% positive, but there's a good chance this is the only account that's compromised at this point. What have we done? We
disabled the known compromised account, done a password reset in preparation for it being re-enabled, and we've reset every existing session. And so now we don't need to know all the things. We have a few things left. We need to know how did the attack happen? How did they get in? What was the account used for once they were in? And was there any persistence in place after they got in? So first, we, we think about the methods that they could have gotten those credentials. We assumed it wasn't brute force because if it was brute force, we was in fail, 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 fail uh, then a success, unless they happened to guess the correct password on the first try. But what we'd, we didn't see that. We didn't see a bunch of attempts of failures and uh, then a success. Um, so it was kind of indicative that they, they had the password at the time they were entering it. So we thought, well, it's phishing. That's when we hit a brick wall. Because Google also has a few premium features. Um, at their lowest tier, you get all the things. You get Google Drive, you get Gmail, all their applications. But email retention is 30 days and the attacker has been in the system for four months. And so our best guess is that she received a phishing email. She, of course, was like, no, I didn't, I swear. But one, it's been four months. Two, users always say they didn't receive the phishing email. So we would have liked to search the logs from the time period that the logging got. Like, that would have been our ideal thing. See what email she received at that time and look for the email that said, like, phishing in the subject line. But we did not get to do that because it was a premium feature. So our, the best we could get due to the retention periods and the amount of time the attacker had been in the system is most likely based on the methods uh, that the attacker has and based on the logs we do have, it was likely phishing. So then we want to see what did they do when they were in the system. And Google, they log everything. There's no like turning on logging. It's not like Windows where you go to do an investigation and you're like, cool, can you show me those logs? And they're like, well, we didn't turn on logging. So logging's all turned on. So we export all the logs. The screenshot, I put it there because it's, uh, we use the Hive. If you haven't looked at the Hive case management system, uh, it's an open source case management system and it's a great platform. You should look it up. But we created tasks to review every one of the logs. Analysts picked them up, put eyes, manually reviewed the activities. Specifically, we kind of looked at it overall, but we were really keying in on that one compromised account, trying to see what did they do, what did they log into, what did they change any settings, did they do anything strange with email, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we ended up not really getting anything from it. It didn't seem like they did anything. They just came for the comments. They, from what it seems, they logged in and they looked around. And that kind of aligns with what we were told, like keyed off the company to the thing is that somebody was taking proprietary information, customer data, client lists, and using it for other purposes, spamming and phishing and stuff. So in, in some sense, it's not surprising. Um, it also meant that we, there wasn't much more evidence to find because they got in, they pulled some flight lists, and they kept logging in over the four months on occasion. So it looks like they were just sitting there reading the data, seeing what they could use from that information. So it was a breach of confidentiality rather than integrity. So going back to persistence, <clears throat> this is a, there's a lot of ways that the attacker could have set up we basically had to manually check all of the um, settings in G Suite to see if any of these kind of methods exist. It'd be nice if I had all the elite programming skills and could automate this, but I just had the ideas, like, because G Suite has an API where you can call the settings, so, like, ideally, you'd be able to call all these settings and check them. But I'm a plebe and don't program, so I just manually check all these settings. But some of the ways you can think about how they would persist, because obviously you don't have scheduled tasks or startup uh, registry keys to make your malware run. So there's app passwords. So of course, I get to the point where we say if 2FA would have been in place, we would have been good. Well, 
adding 2FA after, if there are app passwords, may not uh, help at all because app passwords are for when you have like a mail client and um, you have G Suite, uh, you have 2FA enabled, but the mail client doesn't know how to handle 2FA. So instead, you have to give it basically a password only account that's specialized for that use. Um, but if I'm an attacker, I have the password, I figure they're gonna finally get smart and put 2FA on, I can basically sync to my mail client with that specialized password that doesn't require second factor token. So you need to check to make sure there's no app passwords um, that the attackers added and remove them if so. There's a lot you can do with APIs in Google and you have to authorize the API, but if while I'm in the system, I create APIs that will send me information and it's already approved, it's just gonna keep going. So that's another aspect you need to look at. Going back to the uh, 2FA thing, if I'm afraid 2FA is gonna go on the account, like I'm pretty positive I could get back in um, social engineering or whatever, but now they're gonna have 2FA. I can add my own 2FA device that I now use once you enable 2FA. Like I turn it on for you, but I set it up on my phone too. I could, if I notice you've enabled it while I'm in the account, I can download those backup codes so that I can retrieve, use the backup codes to log in later. Uh, in the case of this person who was really just interested and in, it seemed interested in getting proprietary information, if they were smarter, they would have set up like email forwarding and forwarded all emails to their own personal account so that even when you're kicked out, all her emails are still going to you. So you don't even have to log in because she's basically forwarding you all her emails. And again, email filters, similar things, setting up redirects or something so that emails go to you. That's also a method of staying hidden once you get in is making sure that you have email filters, like if there's any uh, Google suspicious login alerts that those emails aren't being delivered. So the key moral of the story is use two-factor authentication. If you are logging in via the web, use two-factor authentication. It's, it's, your password, it's like the only thing that is really, truly, without a doubt, going to keep that account secure. And it was one thing when everything was on-prem and you couldn't access email easily from outside. But when you're using Gmail to log in, you should have 2FA enabled for everyone. That's, that's kind of the if only they would have moral. The thing is, people think 2FA is hard and Executives don't like to do 2FA, so they just say it's not a requirement. So when you inevitably come across a company that was breached and they didn't have 2FA on, the lesson is that like Ron Swanson and Bacon, you should be prepared. As an incident responder, you are gonna come across environments that you may not be familiar with, tools that you may not be familiar with. I was lucky because working with an MSSP, it wasn't an internal incident where there's an incident and it was go. We had the, the whole contract signing and NDA and all that stuff, so I had a, a little while, a few hours where I knew what was coming. So I read every single G Suite documentation I could. Um, actually, the kind of the reason I started writing this presentation and I've wrote an, written a blog post on it was there wasn't much on defer in G Suite specifically. Um, but I read all the documentation. I, my company uses G Suite, so I logged into our admin panel and I clicked on every single setting so that when I got into the client's environment, I would feel comfortable and know what I'm doing. So that idea of if you could encounter it, be prepared for it. And the, the other flip side of it, though the environment can change, the core fundamentals, the core procedures related to incident response are gonna stay the same. Yes, you may click on a different button here or there, or you may check for different things, but overall you're still following the NIST incident response framework of preparation, uh, detection and analysis, containment eradication and remediation, and post-incident activity. That's not gonna change. It's just the uh, mindset that you need to bring with it and you need to adjust that mindset, especially as we're moving into 
non-traditional environments. We're moving into cloud environments and um, other situations where kind of the things are gonna work differently. So I have to know that there's less limited ways to get in, but there's also more ways they could, and different ways they could establish persistence. I knew I wasn't gonna get a hard drive and run memory forensics, but I knew I was gonna have a bunch of uh, logs regarding different apps that I'd have to look at. So it's that flexibility that we need in IR, especially in DEFER, especially as environments are changing. There's moving to the cloud, there's um, things like containerization, like it's a, like kind of a specialty, like I'm, even forensic people in this room who feel comfortable getting a hard drive and doing hard drive forensics, would you feel comfortable if I gave you a Docker container that you had to perform forensic analysis on? It's those kinds of things where you may not come across it now, but there's a good chance that one day you will come across it. So even if you can't prepare for every environment in terms of the exact controls you need to use, you should be preparing to alter your mindset based on the environment you're going into. My talk ran a little short, but if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. So uh, with, with GCP, uh, doing all of your forensic research and just the log that they give you, is that enough? But do you also like, get in contact with people and so maybe they're a forensic team or what their support that is? Well, in my situation, the clients we work with are SMBs and they don't have anyone. That's where you ask them who their IT team is and they're like, well, Jerry took a computer class once and he like kind of knows what he's doing. Um, so we don't get in contact with their team. We did, I mean, we did talk to the client and say like, did you click a phishing email four months ago? But like I said, like one, even if they were gonna tell me, it's unlikely they'd remember. And sure enough, they said, no, we haven't. Um, there is, the, the logs that they do have are pretty detailed and what, what we would do in this situation, obviously this was like a one time they called us for IR, but for our clients who we perform regular monitoring services on, if they have G Suite, we'd use the, you can forward those logs to a SIM with their API. So we'd get those in the SIM and even though Google's not keeping them for more than 30 days, we would keep them for more than 30 days. So that's kind of the preparation phase of IR making sure that you have what you need when the time comes that you need it. Yeah? Uh, I don't know if y'all looked, but were they using G Drive? They were using um, Google Drive for company documents, so. And y'all looked into that from a forensic perspective? Um, yeah, so it's kind of like, so it's kind of cool because it, it's not the exact file met metadata in the sense that you see on a Windows machine, but you can look at the files and see the change date and revision history. Um, we did review the files to see if any had been altered. There had been no altering. There had been no sharing. That's another method of persistence kind of that I didn't touch on. You could set the share, the Google Drive files to be publicly accessible. So even if you kick me out, I can still go look at all those files I shared. Um, but there's no evidence of messing with the settings related. It seemed like they didn't have any persistence. They were just looking. And um, at the time, we, we did not, um, have I, we were not able to look into whether there was methods of seeing who viewed a file. Uh, that'd be interesting for further research, but at that point we did not. And they didn't have it like set for offline mode before? Um, I don't believe they did. It was all up there, so yeah. It, I mean, it is possible. Again, the, the data, it wasn't clearly there. It's not in the metadata whether somebody downloaded it, so it is possible that they downloaded the files locally. Um, but it's gonna take more research figuring out where the evidence is for that. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you had any, uh, I guess, uh, if you found anything valuable with the Google takeout, like uh, any extra metadata or anything like that. Like, uh, I guess it's like they call it takeout, but there are archives of all the files in the email and stuff like that. Um, if y'all were able to use that or leverage that at all for any of the stuff that you Um. The, you're talking about Google's archiving functionality? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so that's one of the paid features where it's oh, not on the lowest tier, it's like tiers two and three. You only get it with like the enterprise. Yeah, it, I think they have it the one below two, which is like Google Business or Google Teams or something. Uh, okay. But at the lowest tier, you get the products and you get 30 days email retention. Um, logs seem to stay on there more than 30 days. It's only emails that roll over. 
But um, yeah, they, there is a built-in backup functionality if you pay the additional amount. Yep. Any other questions? No? Okay, cool. Thank you all for coming.